First, thanks to all of you for both attending the conference and coming to this session today. It's one that I think is uh, both really important and is going to be of growing importance, which is uh, why I'm so pleased to have the panel that we have. First, by way of introduction then, my name is David Brocht. I'm with QTech Rock, uh, but some of you, and in fact, uh, I've been involved in the Wind and Solar Conference I think all 15 times or nearly so. I'm, my, my advancing age apparently is starting to affect my, my memory. Uh, but I've been around so long that they had my past employer on this title uh, page at first uh, because I was formerly the director of the Nebraska Energy Office. And that really is the beginning of really some of my interest into how this, uh, where this issue fits. By my background is one where I start out, I'm an ag guy, grew up in Northeast Nebraska, have been involved in uh, ag banking and energy and agriculture development of lots of different kinds. And I am really seeing those merging together in our current marketplace as how we develop and how we uh, make our energy, how we use energy is of growing importance in agriculture. And we're one of the aspects of that that connects with our energy and agriculture is our net metering system here in, in Nebraska. So with that, we have a really great panel this morning uh, that I think is going to give a fantastic kind of uh, insight from a multiple of different perspectives, uh, some that have been involved in the net metering side for a long time and some that are newer players, but certainly are, have a very broad view. Uh, so among our panelists are, are Jeff Bergren with Valley Irrigation, and that's of uh, a uh, company that's been obviously in Nebraska for a long time. And many of us might not be as familiar with what they're doing in their Valley Solar uh, unit. And we're, I look forward to Jeff sharing with us the work that's going there. Also, Tim Chancellor with Thomas Livestock. And Tim's going to talk with us about how they're using solar energy and see the future of solar energy and renewable energy in their uh, swine operation. And then finally, and I would say with a fairly high degree of confidence, with the possible exception of Mr. Hansen, uh, the person with the longest tenure involved in net metering and doing some of the solar here, Michael Shanka with uh, Solar Heat and Electric. And he will share with us both uh, some of the history of how our net metering system is developed in Nebraska, uh, but also how um, uh, what he's seen as a developer over his long history. So rather than uh, take a lot of time with my part, I'll interject some questions either both during and after. And I would say, um, unless, uh, you know, each of the speakers have, may have their own preference, but, but I'd like this to be a conversation too a little bit. And so if you have some questions on how things work, please do uh, raise your hand and, and uh, let us know. And, and uh, when it's the right time, I'll call on you and we can get those questions asked. So with that, I'm gonna start with Jeff Bergeron then. Well, good morning, everyone, and I'm really happy to be here again. This is, I think, man, at least my 12th, 11th or 12th year coming to the conference. I can remember go back when it started with just a small group of wind developers and, and John and everybody over in Kearney. So it's been been a long time. Um, I've met a lot of you in the past with my previous jobs with uh, GenPro Energy and Amoresco. Um, this is actually, I think, my 13th year in the, in the solar business, which kind of makes me one of the older guys, um, not as old as Michael, but get in there. Um, so about a year ago, um, I ended up taking a job with Valley. Um, I'm a farm boy from Nebraska. My family's farms north of Aurora. The Valley name's always been really important to us, highly recognized. Um, when I found out they were getting into solar, um, I was pretty happy about it. I was surprised. I didn't know anything. So I'm going to fill you guys what was how that happened, um, what's going on, and maybe talk a little about how we're going to try to help Nebraska with the future of solar in the state. So Valley was founded in 1959 and pivot irrigation was invented here in Nebraska. Um, the Valley founder didn't invent it, but he bought the patents from the guy in Columbus. And Valley is actually a division of Valmont. And I never knew this, but Valmont Industries name came from a combination of putting Valley and Fremont together. And our headquarters um, is right here in Omaha. 
the main manufacturing is in Valley, but we've got manufacturing spread across the state from Oma or from Valley all the way to McCook with um, entities all over the state. Nebraska is very important to us. So Valmont's newest division is Valley uh, Solar Ag, I guess, by Valley. Uh, I have to be careful what I say because there's some registered trademarks out there still. But we make everything. Uh, we supply substations to utilities. We're the largest galvanized metal producer in the world. We have, um, if you see a metal utility or a light pole, most likely it's a Valmont product or associated with Valmont in some way. Um, and also recently we started manufacturing a solar tracker that's been going for about five years now as well. And we've got a lot of those around. Our new headquarters in Omaha is just off of Dodd street out by about one fiftieth. It's a lead certified building. Um, it's super, super efficient, um, to the point that I think it's one of the highest rated buildings in the Midwest, if not the United States. So we take it pretty seriously, um, for sustainability as a company. So the solar division, which I work for for Valley is our newest division. Um, we're not new to solar as a company though. We started down in Brazil four years, a little over four years ago, uh, when they partnered up with a company called Solbras. And Solbras was a standalone company that was doing very well uh, in putting solar in their ag environments in Brazil. Now, I knew Brazil was a big corn and soybean producer as we are here. I didn't realize how fast they had grown and what a market it is. It is a huge agricultural market down there um, for us, for John Deere, for Case, all the producers. Um, so we actually did very well with Solbras as partners. We acquired the majority of stake of them in 2020. And in the last four years of partnership, in the first year, they did three solar um, installations together. The second year, they did 10, I think. But last year, they did over 100. And it has just increased by leaps and bounds, uh, literally exponentially. Since then, we've expanded into other markets. Um, next, we put up test units in Africa. Then we went to the Middle East. And now we have a fully functioning unit in uh, Europe, where I actually report to the guys over in Spain. And they're just going gangbusters uh, throughout Europe currently. We have gigawatts uh, installed throughout the world. Here's a little picture of how it's kind of spreading in, in Brazil. I like how it's you can see that it's just kind of moved across the, the states of Brazil where the agriculture was. The amount of solar that they're putting online is faster than I think any, at least any other market we're operating in right now. Two reasons for that is their grid isn't as advanced as ours. And in a lot of the remote areas, the power utilities are really hungry for the power. They'll take anything they can get. So the regulations are a lot less and the willingness of the um, utilities is right there to get as much as they can get in the rural areas, especially. Um, so what's happening now? We've had a lot of success down in South America, success in Europe. Finally, they decided to bring it here to the United States. And that's where I've been brought in. I've been brought in to train our dealership network, our irrigation dealers across the United States and Canada, how to add a solar line to their product line. Uh, there's 200, over 200 in the United States and Canada. Uh, there's about 40 here in Nebraska um, that we'll work with. And they have the option of whether adding the solar line or not. They can just stay in irrigation or they can become a Valley um, solar dealer as well. We go out and I train them up on the sales and the basic background and things like that. And the good thing is installing a solar system as compared to installing a pivot is pretty easy these days. The solar systems have gotten much more plug and play. Um, the ease of installation has just become very, very easy for guys that already have the equipment, that already have a lot of the part numbers in their system. They can just go out and add this product line really easily. So they've really, the adoption rate has been really good for the dealer signing on. So for the first three projects, we're actually going to send out a foreman. We're going to design the system, send out someone to help them learn, train their guys. As they're training up their guys, um, we'll, we can send in an electrician. A lot of them have an electrician on staff already that we can train up. So for the first three projects, they're really getting their hand held. But after that, it's just going to be like how they order a pivot. They'll order a, a 25 or a 50 kilowatt kit. They'll be able to install it. And then that system is going to be backed by that Valley dealership network, which is huge. Um, our brand recognition is in the ag industry is one of the best. And that's one of the reasons I, I chose to come work to Valley. 
We have 50 year old products out there that we still make parts for. If you have a Valley product that is still operating today and it breaks down, we're going to fix it. Um, it's that simple. We're also one of the most innovative companies in the ag space. Um, and we're super customer driven. Our farm customers from the smallest one pivot customer to the giant guys who buy 60 or 70 pivots a year are all the same to us. They, and they've got the backing of our dealership, our techs and Valley as a company. So we got off to a, a really good start. Um, they really just started last year here in America and we've got a team of eight people now. Um, I'm a territory sales manager, meaning that I'm going to be training up the sales teams at these dealerships. And we currently have projects in Illinois, Nevada, Washington, Florida, Canada. Um, and I think we're just looking at another one, another one here in Illinois I just found out about. But we've only got one 25 kilowatt project here in Nebraska, and I'll, I'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, the projects range anywhere from 25 kilowatts up to two megawatts. Um, if we get above that two megawatt size, then we have Valley or Valmont Utilities that makes the trackers and everything else. They can handle any size system up from two megawatts. Um, so why are we in these states? Um, Illinois has a very easy process, um, online interconnect agreements. You literally get on, you can get your permit online, you can get your interconnect agreement set up and online ready to go. Um, and they also have a higher net metering cap. Some of these states and Canada in particular, particular have a province um, incentive to where they will actually incentivize the customers to put solar in. A lot of those, uh, not a lot, but some of them are ag based. So they apply to um, the agricultural producers in Canada, for instance, some of the provinces allow you to go up to 150 kilowatts on your farm and any excess generation you can sell for not only the net metering rate, the the current rate, but you'll also get a, a feed in tariff on top of that. So there's a bonus and incentive to put in solar. Um, Illinois has some of that as well. Um, Nevada and Washington also have some pretty robust things in the, in the pipeline right now. And another big thing is Illinois specifically has a rec market to where you can, the, the kilowatt hours you generate also generate renewable energy credits. And there's a market and a state incentive for you to sell those renewable energy credits and they can reduce the ROI on these systems significantly. So the challenges here in Nebraska and um, why we're focused on Nebraska. Nebraska is our home state. It is the most important state to us. They're all important, but we were born here. The pivot was invented here. Um, we are focused on Nebraska. We want to see solar on farms, not across the, the river in Iowa, but right here in Nebraska as well. Um, some of the challenges we've run into so far is there's 150 plus power entities here in Nebraska. We're the only public power state. There's no standard interconnect agreement. When we operate in Illinois or Washington um, with those utilities, there's usually only one or two utilities. There's a standardized agreement. Like I said, some of them are even online. You can click through and get them done pretty quickly. Um, we've run into some outdated equipment or I guess I don't know if outdated is the word, but some different equipment with a couple of the utilities to where our standard worldwide accepted equipment will not interact in a way that they, they would allow. So we've been shut off on projects that way. Um, we've also been hit with insurance requirements, which according to the current law, the interpretation of that is whether or not that's even necessary or not, but we've have run into that. Um, we've also run into some of the utilities having response times that are very slow. Now, there's a lot of good ones out there, but out of the 150, there's just a few of them out there that have taken, taken some time. And then the biggest thing for us is the 25 kilowatt cap. There's um, for our customers with grain drying, hog barns, chicken coops, pivots, um, everything you can think of, 25 kilowatts just isn't enough. Uh, it's a drop in the bucket. We'd like to see um, something like Omaha is done with 100 kilowatts. Um, it really works well and we can offset, you know, a good portion of our customers needs. And a lot of our customers are setting their own goals, especially the big land management companies and the big farms. They have their own ESG goals and sustainability goals that they are being forced to meet from the top down. And there are several of those in Nebraska right now that are struggling to meet their nationwide goals here in Nebraska. 
So resolutions, Nebraska is our home state. Everything started here. It's super important to us. Um, the early adopters of our technology are right here in the state. Believe it or not, some of the most advanced farmers are here in your backyard. Uh, some of the biggest farmers are here in your backyard. They adopt and bring the newest equipment in as fast as they can. And we see that a lot right here in Nebraska. Um, we're going to be working with legislators, legislators, hopefully to bring some changes or look at potential changes to the net metering law. And we're also helping to form a trade organization for um, solar specifically, I think, to where a group of innovators and installers and um, everybody else, a trade organization, if you will, to get together, kind of like what ethanol has or some other entities like that throughout the state to, to really have one voice and hopefully make um, known some of these issues we run into. So we see it as a positive. We think the time for change is here um, with the new IRA bill and everything else ramping the interest back up. We think now is just the perfect time to get in and, and talk about some changes. So thanks. So uh, thanks, Jeff. I don't know if there's any immediate questions. Um, I might have one to, for you to think about because I want to have that lead into what Tim's going to talk about, but the broad range of ag sectors that, that really are showing opportunity and those that are going to happen first. And I think that to set up that question is, I'm happy to introduce uh, Tim Chancellor and have him talk about uh, what they're doing at Thomas Livestock. All right. This is going to be fun. I. Uh, I have a ter terrible fear of public speaking. <laughs> that might not be true. So uh, I, I'm gonna talk to you about uh, what we are doing with solar on our operation and how that's been working for us and kind of what we've been going through. And then I'm gonna also talk about from a producer's side, what I see uh, going forward as a workable solution between our local public power districts and us as bill payers, producers, farmers, ranchers, business owners, homeowners, and how that, uh, I, I've got some creative ideas uh, that I think a lot of us have talked about uh, through the last two or three years. And some movement can be made going forward so that we can have a good working relationship. Uh, I come at everything I do with that stance, okay? Good business to me is when all parties involved can sit down at the table, come up with a honest, truthful, working solution that works for each side going forward. And I'll give you some examples of that as I go through my, my talk, uh, what we've done and some headway that we've made and some really good examples of things that, that have been working well. So I'm Tim Chancellor, just a little background. I'm the Wean Finish Supervisor with Thomas Livestock out in Broken Bow, Nebraska, RJ Thomas. I've been with RJ Thomas 30 years now, and I own four Wean Finish sites. Our sites are a little different than a lot that some of you may have in your area. All of our buildings, the majority of them are 6,250 head quad barns. So they're large units. A lot of the ones around the area are on a 2,400 head platform. Ours are a little bit different. There's four rooms with center working areas and, and office. And so our energy needs on those sites are larger, of course, than it would be on a 2,400 or some of you may see the thousand head double curtain sided barns. I still own some of those and they operate and, and work uh, very well still. So there's, there's a lot of broad range there when we look at ag, when we look at commercial industry, residential. And that's one point I'm going to kind of cover. It's really hard in my mind when we talk about net metering and goals of setting a kilowatt that works for everyone because our energy consumption is different on my house and my 6,250 head finishing barn. And if I put 25 kW on my house, I'm overproducing. If I put it on my hog barn, 
it hardly makes sense to go to the expense of doing it. And so I think there's some opportunity there going forward to talk about a percent of your actual usage on an annual basis, however that works, of what is allowable for you to offset your business cost on a use basis. Now there has to be some limitations there and I know with with the public districts, they can't just say, well, we've got all the energy sitting here. When you need it, we're gonna have it available for you, but you only need that twice a year and it's really hard for them to just sit there with a battery and say, here it is for you. So that's where you've gotta have a working solution. With our industry, it works quite well because our energy consumption is pretty constant day and night, every day of the year. There's some disease problems, some barns set empty for a week, different things that might uh, offset that every once in a while. And we've worked with that with our public power districts to look at that and, and try to balance that out, how that works whenever we aren't using the energy load that we usually use. But there's good workable solutions there. Uh, some of you may know me, I've been the president of the, Nash, or the Nebraska Pork Producers Association. Uh, I'm not currently, Whew, got that off my plate, no, it, it, it was good. But through that, uh, we started talking about offsetting some of our cost. We always talk about that. A lot of times we talk about pennies per pig in the building. And I started looking at the solar, and at that time I was... Uh, I didn't take the time to research it like I needed to. Fortunately, my son came back and joined the operation. And at that time, I gave that project to him to research, to reach out, to start working. And from that point, we moved forward. Uh, two of my sites, we have 25 kW on the building. That's what's allowed in that public power district. And then Another public power district, I was able to do a pilot project with them and put 100 kW units on those two buildings as a pilot project so we could monitor the usage and where that, uh, how that works with the public power district, with our facility and how it offsets loads and cost. And having those two platforms has been very beneficial to see how it works. Uh, right now, currently, uh, and Bobby's here today, D Dawson Public Power District, I've been working with them with the pilot project. And you can have some questions for him later in the day. Uh, if, if that works out, I'm sure he'll answer questions about how it's working, how it hasn't been working, things that we've adjusted. But with the new technology, we're able to absolutely not overproduce. If they want us to limit at 24.6 kilowatts, we can just shut it down so it never overproduces that during the day. And with our peak load being right in the center of the day and the heat of the afternoon, it's producing then and overproduces a little bit there and then tail when it starts to tail off from the sun, then it picks that up and offsets that and it's been a really good working relationship. And, and my stance is I would like to see solar when we talk about this, when we get new legislation, when we change things, become something that benefits Nebraska producers, Nebraska business owners, homeowners. I know there's a huge advantage to having a great big cell of solar panels in one place rather than having them on the rooftops of hog barns and dairy barns and feedlots and houses. And I'm fine with that as long as the people paying the bill and the actual producer in Nebraska can offset their cost by doing that, okay? I don't care if the, the solar panel's on top of my building, but I wanna be able to have a piece of it to offset my business cost. We, we spend every day trying to survive in Nebraska and produce and keep our dollars in Nebraska and pay our taxes in Nebraska and do our business in Nebraska. 
I think it's unfair for out-of-state investors, in-state investors to come in, build large units, suck it all up, and we sit there paying the bill and don't have a chance to offset our business cost and build another barn so we can pay more taxes to help our school districts, to keep our local communities thriving. And I think, I think that needs to be forefront in decisions going forward. Uh, I, I'm going to give kudos to Dawson Public Power. I went down and sat down with them and asked them to please set aside a percentage for brick and mortar local businesses when we talk about this type of a platform. And that was received very well. And, and I, I know there's probably other power districts that are doing the same thing in Nebraska. I'm just giving them kudos for their willingness to recognize their local producers that, that they supply energy to. And so that's, that's really important in my heart. And I think it should be for all of us going forward. And like I said, whether it's a big block that makes more economic sense to build it that way, that's fine. But let me buy 3% of that and offset my bill. Not sell it for 3 cents to offset my bill. Actually, that production goes to my meter credit. And I think things like that are where we can sit down and make good decisions from both sides. Uh, I think in the last six months, we've gotten closer to a platform where everybody can sit down and talk through some of these things rather than just being of the stance, no, we're not changing or yes, we need to change. Uh, from solar providers, I'll, I'll say I have also seen, there was a bill a couple years ago that came through and wanted everybody to be able to produce 120% and you had to buy it back in this. If we go down that rabbit hole, that road, that's not being fair either, okay? It's great for business. It's not great for business, okay? Having something that works for both sides is what's great for business. That's where we're gonna see our growth and our change in Nebraska. So I think, I think that's my key point for people to understand. As far as how it's working for me, it's working great. I can see the offset on the uh, savings on the bill. Uh, I did take advantage of a portion of the, the grant process uh, through Nebraska. There was a percentage that I could take or I could go into the national pool. I chose to just go ahead and take the percentage that was available from the Nebraska funds and that worked out well. And then also the energy loan, I took advantage of that. That is something that I think gets overlooked a lot of times that is a wonderful program. The banks, if they understand it, absolutely love it. Am I getting close on my time? Okay, all right. Uh, it gives the credit to the bank to fund a percentage of the loan and get the interest for the entire amount. So if a bank doesn't understand it, if you have any problem uh, with your local bank, uh, I've got a couple banks that would drive to your house to get that loan. It, it, it's a great loan, okay? And it's, it's a great thing for us putting solar on our buildings as business owners to have a reasonable interest rate on a 10 year project and see that pay off and, and work into our system. Everything I do is a 10 year. I build a barn, it's a 10 year payoff. So this worked, uh, this was right up my, my alley when we started working on this and I was really excited about it. So there's a lot of things in place that Nebraska is doing that are available that, that we're set to grow and to make this part of Nebraska. The element we're missing is everybody getting together and seeing what works going forward, okay? None of us want to cost our neighbors more money. And I know that's been some of the argument. That's where if you produce 120%, that's a problem. Somebody's gotta pay for that. I realize, and I know the importance, because when I lose power, our backup generators kick on, but it's a job to keep sure everything. 20 minutes I have if I lose power before I start losing life in the barns. Power is very important to me. And I know the cost that they have to put poles in to 
the transformers to keep the lines up. If you guys haven't seen them out after a storm fixing stuff when no one else wants to be out, they are a value to our community. And we have to make sure that their costs are covered. Okay. And that's where we have to have a fairness. I think that, and from some of the stuff that we've done, somewhere around that 70, 80%, maybe it's 65. And that's something we, we, this is our second year on our pilot project. And that's the value of that, seeing where those costs are at. So we're not costing our neighbors to pay for our solar project that's sitting on our roof. So that we're not costing our local utility and robbing money from them. They, they've got to have income coming in so they can keep the lines up, so they can keep the crews out there, so they can keep power to our place. So that's the working relationship. And I hope everybody has that on the forefront of their mind. If we don't, we're going to be stuck right where we're at for a long time. So I think that's kind of wrap up on what I've got. I'll take questions later on or I'll be around if anybody wants to visit. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Jim. I do think just because I think those two presentations fit together and, and really also show what I saw when I first went to the uh, Nebraska Energy Office. At the time, at least on paper, what the state of Nebraska showed was solar energy uh, well less than a megawatt. And I think, John, you reported that uh, within the state today, or maybe it was Jim, in Jim Macy's presentation too, you know, we're in the 30 or 40 megawatts, if I'm not mistaken, maybe 50, 50 megawatts. So really phenomenal growth. And I think that, and, and Tim mentioned it, the dollar energy and savings loan program that we worked on through the energy office, what we viewed then was solar was something that was new to people and we were trying to say, okay, how does it work? And then what are those opportunities? And that's where I continue to see that. And so I wanna ask a couple questions while it's still fresh in our mind. And I'd invite you too in the audience, but, but um, uh, thinking about the different sectors across the country, uh, and Brazil is a little different, but maybe there, in Valley, you know, what sectors of ag are, do you see the most potential immediately? Is it, I do think it's a great fit. A poultry barn and a hog barn is basically a barn that's full of fans and lights that run all the time and are needed the most from one to five when the sun's beating down on it. That's the way I look at it. Where else in ag do you see that today? Surprisingly, when we go out and just look at the farm set itself, we don't do any of the residential type solar. We're not going to put it on their roof, but we do do ground mounts and we do do like their machine shops. If they have an operating machine shop, we're surprised when we do the, the yearly um, usage of those because as soon as they come out of the field, while they're in the field, they're fixing things at the break. But a lot of them, especially the bigger entities, they do more work in the winter in their shops and use more electricity in the winter um, when everybody's back there using the welders and the grinders and everything else. So just the farmstead itself. Um, then if we can get talk about yearly true up versus monthly, um, if it's a yearly true up, you could take advantage of, you know, the pivots a little better, um, but also the grain drying operations, which just use a ton of electricity for just, you know, a few weeks in the fall, usually if, if it's a, a dry year, but that can that can be extended as well. And then grain operating legs as well take quite just take some pretty good amount of energy as well. So. I was surprised that the hog barns and the chicken coop are absolutely number one because like Tim said, 20 minutes without air and those, they've got problems. Um, and it's a consistent load. The most consistent load that we've ever modeled was a hog barn because it's just a straight line throughout the year of what they use. So it's a perfect fit for solar um, on the hog barns and the chicken barns. Tim, sort of following up on that, so in, in that, uh, I know that I've read some articles and, and admittedly have been digging into it a little bit deeper on, on behalf of some clients. But when you think about your customers, and sometimes in ag, we'll tend to say customer, and we think about, because they are, that end-use customer who's eating a food product, but Tim doesn't talk with them as much as he does probably or in people in the organization, that packer buyer. And thinking, what have you been hearing in the industry and in your role as Nebraska Public Power, that ESG that, that Jeff mentioned earlier? Yeah, and I, I didn't 
cover that. Uh, but on, on that side of it, all the time there's companies coming out with uh, new announcements that they're going to be uh, offset power by 2032 or 2022 and different ones and stuff. And so there's carbon credits and different things. And our packer buyer that, that we go through uh, have made those statements. And that was part of my decision also to put the solar on my swine units. That animal going into that supply chain can be viewed as a carbon credit all the way through into their plant, into their in supply chain for to meet their goals and, and standards that they have set. And so there's there's value back to me by doing that. Uh, in the swine world, the consumer dictates the product as they should, okay? Uh, we, all of our facilities are group housed. And what that means is all of the sows aren't in crates standing in a crate. They are in pens of 270 with chips in their ear that reads them. They come into feeder, it mixes their feed form, it weighs them, gives them a body scores that come out. Technology is unbelievable in the swine industry. But they'll go through with that group house program, there's a bonus paid for the meat that you buy on the shelf. If a company, McDonald's has said, all of our sa breakfast sausage is gonna be group house certified, there's a premium for that product that they're putting to the consumer. It doesn't change anything about the life of the pig, it's that the sow can walk around in a pen with other sows. But those are the things, same thing with if we're energy neutral and they make that statement, there are a group of consumers out there that look for that. And so that's the ability uh, that it gives us and the advantage it gives us and a premium sometimes to stay in business. And, and I'm gonna take moderator prerogative here a little bit to, to kind of reflect on a client that I'm working on right now, that's exactly at that point. How many of you have heard about Nebraska certified beef? Is that something? Mm -hmm. And and for those that I'm a, came out of the beef industry, that's what I grew up on uh, family wise. And uh, I would say of the state programs, Nebraska certified beef, particularly in the international market, has been the most successful. Um, and I have a client right now, and we are working on really assessing and trying to have for a specialty market to, to be able to do some sustainability on both not just energy, but also water and greenhouse gases and all of those things put together and have that be an added value. So it's like a Nebraska certified beef plus. And in fact, some other efforts that are going on, I'm aware of within the university system, uh, that there's a pretty high degree of confidence and they're working on the numbers right now that would actually show our Nebraska beef in part because we grow a lot of baby calves in the sand hills that end up getting fed in Nebraska feed yards. And we're feeding with Nebraska corn that's grown right here. And I'm also an ethanol industry uh, uh, kind of veteran or have my scars from it too. Our distillers grains, unlike most states, is usually taken wet, so no natural gas used to dry it, to a feedlot when it's actually a better feedlot uh, uh, feed product in the first place. And that all of that taken together probably means our Nebraska beef, just the way we do it every day, has a lower carbon intensity than any other beef in any other state. And just as Tim just said, there is a marketplace for that. There's a, there's a segment of the market that is willing to reward the producer and pay for those values. And so that's what I meant by uh, when I started saying those value opportunities that I saw going forward and how we can try and integrate our Nebraska, our producers, and frankly take advantage of our public power status because the, our power is generated and, and really managed within the community. So we should be in as good a spot as anywhere to see that. So I wanted to, I, I don't know if anybody has any specific questions on that, because we're gonna turn, kind of pivot a little bit and take advantage of Michael's long history and 
how that's how, how that has developed over the years and what he's seen as a developer. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. I, I, our speakers this morning to follow these guys is it's really incredible. Uh, we've had some great uh, ideas uh, put forward, and there's a reason this it was called opportunities in net metering. And that's because we're looking forward to a lot of opportunity within public power, within our ag industries, within our communities uh, to move forward with solar. So I'm going to skip over a, a number of slides because we've already talked about this. Uh, but I did want to start at least at the beginning and, and a nod to that. The hard work that went into passing a 47 to 0 legislative bill, that was tremendous. It does not happen very often. It took a lot of negotiation, took a lot of hard work on both sides, give and take, compromise, the whole thing. And that's just a tremendous accomplishment, I'd like to say right off. And at the preamble of the bill, we had some lofty goals. We're going there. We're still going there. Those are excellent goals. They are current today. These are the things that we want to achieve moving forward with public power and our industries that we have. I'm going to skip over a few of these slides because I think we're further down the chain here. This is a, a critical point. It's all about the economy. It's all about the economics of it. It's all about Nebraska being globally competitive, whether it's in our industries or it's with our agriculture. Net metering is pivotal. That policy is extremely important, and we need to add more policies, wrap around that with additional types of incentive programs and things that benefit both public power and their shareholder constituents. One of the things that I like to point out is that we're at an evolutionary point right now. Now, when you're at the present looking in the past, you can see a lot of pivot points. Things where if we chose differently, we would make different decisions today, we'd be in a different place today. We're at a point today where the decisions we make are going to affect not just our children, but our grandchildren. And the forefathers that set up public power will be proud for making those choices, I think. I'm pretty sure. I'm absolutely certain. <laughs> anyway, one of the things we need to think about, yeah, right. Uh, so we're going to need storage. As we develop more solar in the state, there's going to be more opportunities for generation. We're talking about an industry where private capital is going to be building generation out. They need to manage that. That is going to have to be managed with storage and with uh, two-way substations predominantly. And here's the reason why. Some of you may be familiar with the load profile, but you have the solar has a perfect bell curve with solar noon in the middle. In the morning, the solar is going to be putting its excess energy into storage. During the day, it's going to be basically suppressing a lot of the peak load. And then in the afternoon, the storage is going to kick it back into the grid again to help keep that demand at a more level point, something that generators can adapt to more readily. This is what happens when you have overproduction. And this is a great reason for Nebraska, always being five years behind the rest of the world, to see what they did <laughs> to figure this out. OK, so we have the demand starting in the morning like it normally does. As you see, the solar noon is about right up in here. What is it doing? It's suppressing the mid part of the day so that the demand of generation is reduced in the middle part of the day. Then you get into the acceleration in the afternoon as people go home, they start cooking, uh, they turn the air conditioner down, they turn the heat up, whatever they're doing, they're creating more demand in the afternoon. This is a dangerous part where the grid becomes a little less stable and it's not a really good situation to be in. So in areas with high solar penetration, you're going to have this duck curve, they call it. California found this out about four or five years ago. So now all we have to do is figure out what they did and copy it. You know, I don't think we have too much more problem than that. OK, so here we are, a vision for the future. Let's think about this for a minute. Uh, right now, where we're at is some of the national boys have found solar. And the pickings are easy. 
You come in with somebody who doesn't know much about what they're doing, and you say, I'm going to give you a 20-year loan that's going to approximate what you're paying for your utility right now. Okay, that looks reasonable. I don't know a thing about your product, but yeah, it sounds okay. And then the pitch goes along, well, why do you pay the big bad utility when you could be paying me? And you know, I'm making that personal appeal. These guys are schooled in all kinds of closing techniques and things. Okay, so what we really end up with is we're taking money out of public power and we're putting in some third party not even related to our state. This is ridiculous. All right, if we take this 20 year loan away from them, and the way to do that is for public power to fund some kind of a bond or some kind of a, a, a capital, I don't care how you do it. I mean, a, a New York uh, stockbroker would have this figured out before the appetizer showed up. You know, but if we get some kind of, of, of mechanism and we could use the existing state energy offices uh, loan program part, we could use credit unions and banks, which we're already doing incorporating in that type of program, but fund loans for our people to buy solar. So they don't have to go to some third party. This keeps public power in front of their customer. This stops the erosion of capital that's leaving our state. And right now, it's over a million dollars this year alone. On a 20 year loan, we're talking $20 million just for this year. In two years, it'll be five, it'll be 10 within about another five to six years, million dollars a year gone. That's not a good situation for any business to be in. So we need to fix that. Well, the other thing is we need to look at other opportunities like aggregated metering and virtual metering. Why is this important? If I have three center pivots across the county, why don't I just put it, my solar in one spot where I can manage it better? Maybe there's land next to a substation. Now public power could be managing this property for me. So it keeps public power in the front of the customer. It has to be an arrangement like, like Tim was talking about. We need fairness for all. And so much of what Jeff said was that we need to keep our businesses competitive. So these are the things that we can do with that. Here's where we're at this inflection point right now. Either we take this path where we start integrating these various resources because we're not only really great in sun and wind, well, we got a lot of biomass in this state that we need to be working with, too. And if we don't, we're going to end up with basically divorcing our customer from public power. And that's not a small issue. This is 2015 state-of-the-art equipment available on the market. One product of the year in Europe. One of these will power your house. Two of them, you get air conditioning. <laughs> Okay, so, but I don't think that's gonna happen. I don't think that's the road we're gonna end up going down, but it, I just wanted to show you that it's possible, and in some markets, that is the road. It'll be more of a grid defection. But I think we gotta get back to the big picture, and the big picture is 95 cents out of every dollar that we spend on fuel for our cars, diesel for our tractors, fertilizer, natural gas to heater homes, all of that money leaves the state. It's, that's a data point from, I opened up the annual report in 1983 from the Nebraska Energy Office. That was on the inside cover, except it was 98% then. I've been told by some other factors we've improved a little bit. Okay, so that point is important. Then to dress this up, we're number three in win. We're in the top quartile for solar in the country. Our future is golden. We just gotta take advantage of these kinds of opportunities like we have the resources we have in water and soil. So with that, I'll close. Thank you very much. Thank you. Actually, you can take yours. So again, the, our intent with the focus of this presentation was to talk a lot about how we see this change in the opportunity. Um, and, and again, I think that based on our 
uh, particularly within our ag sector in our rural area. And to, to Mike and, and Tim's point too, the ability to help generate part of that and again capture part of our natural resources and to the extent we can add value then to the products. Uh, those of you that were familiar with me when I was in the energy office, my opening set of almost every presentation I gave was that Nebraska is an energy state. And in fact, has always been an energy state. It's just that we were used to capturing solar energy and shipping it out in a, in a grain car as yellow corn. And then we've, uh, as I said, I spent a lot of time in the ethanol industry. We got used to sending it out as ethanol in a tanker. Uh, and now increasingly, when always, we've always done a lot of livestock. We were cattle and, and largest red meat producer uh, really in, in the country. Uh, but the added value by being able to do that. But we also have a history of that because if you think about it, the Native Americans 250 years ago were doing the same thing. They were just capturing the solar energy with prairie grass and using buffalo meat, buffalo to harvest it and buffalo meat to store it. So we're all doing the same things. It's just how do we move forward and add that added value? Um, I do want to make a point here was we've got a few more minutes uh, on what are what are the other things that are going on in the future? And I think at least uh, somebody, maybe Michael mentioned it, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, is going to be a game changer in many areas. And one of those, and I'll, I might have Bill Shepard raise his hand here. He's with the uh, USDA Rural Development here in Nebraska. And, and maybe just say a note, a note or two on what's happening maybe with the REAP grants or what you expect to be happening. Bill. Thank you, David. I appreciate that. Um, I, I think the realm of what we're doing, I think, fits uh, into what all three of the panelists have been talking about in terms of opportunity. Talk about costs, return on investment, things of that nature. Uh, within USDA Rural Development, uh, we have a program uh, that is titled our Rural Energy for America program, and it's available to producers and small businesses for the primary function of those um, entities to make energy efficiency improvements or install renewable energy systems. Uh, wind and solar tend to be the two technologies in the renewable realm that we've been most familiar with. Um, this program does provide uh, a lot of opportunity in terms of uh, what we could help uh, those producers and business with, with cost share. Uh, we have a grant program that currently covers up to 25% of any eligible project costs. We also have a guaranteed loan program that um, if financing is a need uh, with any project, we can work with lenders uh, and they can uh, utilize our program for a loan guarantee also. David, as you mentioned, um, and I know this has been a common theme in, in terms of referencing or, or mentioning, uh, the IRA will impact our program as well. Uh, we don't know what that looks like yet. Um, with that recently being passed, uh, that is currently being sifted out uh, within our, our policy area and national office, um, but there's more to come on that. What we do know is there's gonna be more funding uh, and, and through the course of what the IRA defined, uh, which is up to 10 years, we know at least for sure. Uh, but that should provide more opportunity. Uh, we don't have details yet, uh, but we will, we will do our best to get the word out there when, when those details are available. Thanks for, thanks for that, Bill. And just to, to add on to that, I think that growth that we saw from 2015 or when I uh, was at the energy office to where we're at today, the start of that really came when we were using our dollar energy savings and loan program and REAP grants to start some of those opportunities. And I think the Inflation Reduction Act in particular to the extent we see some things with the, the REAP program will offer another opportunity within our ag within our ag operations and again looking forward to how do we meet the needs and the demands of our customers uh, if there are any other questions otherwise i'm going to say thank you oh, i do have one in the back there so i'm guessing you guys can probably guess what i'm going to ask um but i feel like we couldn't have this conversation without talking about net billing and how that's slowing things up um shanka you alluded to it a little bit but what do you think's going to happen to the market 
if we see kind of that growing disconnect and that inability in more power districts uh, for individuals to be able to interconnect? Part of what we're working on with the public power districts and with legislation and things going forward is get a standardized billing method that you can actually understand when you get your bill and you can see how that platform is. I think that's really important because there's, there's a lot of difference between public power districts on how uh, easily it is to read and understand the billing process and actually know what you're getting credited for. So I think that's part of it. I think real quick, the opportunity in my eyes, dealing with this over the last three years in legislation with the pork board, privately with my own business and with my public power districts, we have a great opportunity right now. There's more willingness to sit down and talk about how we can structure this and go forward than I've ever seen before. And it's a lot of work, but we've got a lot of good people that understand where we need to be at. We just have to work to get there and do it in a timely manner before someone else comes in and does it. And then the bill payers don't have the opportunity. Us Nebraskans don't have the opportunity to be part of that. I think you pretty well summarized that very well. I, the end of my presentation, the download that we'll have when you go to the website to get our presentations, there's four pages there, some writings that I've done in the past. One of them compares the telecom industry to our current status of, of net metering and such policy. And what I bring out there is that the, when I was in telecom back in the 80s and 90s, what I found was that the emergence of the internet changed the market and the telecom industry could not change with it. They kept trying to make everything work with their paradigm. And I look at the buy, instantaneous buy-sell agreement as something like that. That's, that's a paradigm that is passing. And it, we need to modify it to parts like as Tim has just mentioned. So the net billing is, is not a progressive step. It's almost an intermediary. And right now, as you understand, you know, the cable industry basically owns the residential market for internet access. That was the, in the purview of the, of the telecom industry, but that shifted. I see these parallels today with the power industry across the country and specifically in Nebraska where there can be substitutions for power. But we have public power. We're not a for-profit industry. We got to drive that home and really start leveraging the vitality of that type of a market, which nowhere else in the country can do like we can. So that's the call to, that I see that we have in front of us. And net billing is, is it's part of an older paradigm that we need to get more creative about. I think I'll just touch quickly on what I think the original question was brought up about is um, per the current net metering law, as a district or a municipal utility hits 1% of their, of their load in renewables, they're no longer required to do the net metering. So they're switching to this net billing type of program, um, which isn't, as, as Michael said, beneficial as it is uh, with the true net metering. So that's where it's coming along. We've got several districts now that have met their 1% cap, and they're switching over to the, to the net billing. Kind of a closing comment, and again, um, relying on my experience as energy director, I really do believe, and in particular in the solar market and net metering, maybe even then even one step furthermore, the fact that we are public power and we have this local input. I, I work with uh, clients that are in states where they have one utility that covers the in, that covers multiple states. You just you you don't have that kind of input. So I think that what Michael and all of our panelists have said is talking about how we can take what we need here, not only in the state, but within our individual communities and use that input that our public power structure gives us to be able to reach those needs. And it'll be an incremental process just because that's the way I see changes of, of all kinds that are successful. Really abrupt changes, uh, unless you are incredibly lucky, tend to be 
Um, at least, I don't know about you folks, I don't often get it exactly right the very first time. So uh, that's where I think we can use that iterative process. With that, uh, I think we're going to be starting lunch here shortly, John. And I want to thank everyone for taking part. Uh, lunch will be held upstairs. I'm sure our panelists will hang around here just a little bit, or we'll be here later today. If you have any questions, certainly I am as well. Thank you for attending. <laughs>